thank you for having me. I have a question for you, a question that I'd like to start this talk off with. If you are absolutely successful with the job that you do, how long do you expect your software to last? Do you expect it to last days? I hope not. How about months? Years? What about decades? I've written code 10 years ago. I hope it's still in production 10 years from now. Next question for you. If your code lives that long, how long do you plan on working for it? Decades? We'll see. Your code's going to live a long time. That code will probably outlive your time working on it. Your code's going to become legacy. We always think legacy is a bad swear word in code bases. It's not. Uh, I have my own definition of legacy code, and that's a code base where you do not have direct communication with the original authors. That's what I consider a legacy code base. Why does all this matter? Well, consider this thought exercise. Here's you, and here's the number of tasks you do in a month right now. Go you. You're doing awesome. And if we fast forward a few years, you've moved on. Maybe you've switched teams. Maybe you've gone to another company. Maybe you've given up on software engineering, and you're out woodworking in the forest. Ever floats your boat. And there's some future maintainer who has to go pick up the pieces after you've left. What sort of amount of work do you want them to complete in a month? A small amount where they're struggling against a code base? Or do you want them to be just as productive as you are? When we develop code, we have a duty, a duty to deliver value in a timely manner. That's why they pay us the big bucks. But you have a secondary duty too. That's a duty to make it easy for future collaborators to also deliver value in a timely manner. Your software will fail if you build it and you go fast. And then three years from now, nobody can ship a feature because it's just horrendous working in that code base. So this is a talk about making it easy for your future collaborator. Because do you want your future collaborators to thank you for your foresight and the hard work that you've done? Or do you want them to curse your name, lie awake at night, just muttering oaths at you? This is a talk about robust Python and why it matters. My name's Pat Viafor. Again, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to start off with a definition. What do I mean by robust? I'm going to be talking about robust code bases. A robust code base is full of code, and it's clean and maintainable. It's resilient and error-free in spite of constant change. In spite of constant change, your code will change. This is software. This is not firmware. This is not hardware. Your code will change, and you may not be around to see that happen. How do we make that easy? Let's say we have... This, this is your system, this is your code base, it looks great. It's nice, it's modular, it's well designed, and you're about to leave, you move on to go woodwork in the forest and give up on software engineering, and the team comes along and says, I need to make a tiny little tweak in your code base. You go, sure, sure, just send me the PR. You think it's gonna be a single line, it's this little one line across this component, and then the PR comes in. <laughs> and oh no, they've changed the module, half of the other module looks unrecognizable, and Okay, well, it's not going to be your problem anymore. The rest of your system still looks pretty nice. Look at all the rest of your system that's well designed. Then team two comes in after you're gone. They're going to say, hmm, you know what? I like these parts down here, these bottom left three components, and I'm going to swap them out for a new version because we need to be upgrading the code. And that big piece, it actually does a lot more. So we don't even need all the pieces anymore. So we, we erase those. We don't need them. Then team three comes in. And we say, oh, I need to make a change. And they swap out modules. Then Team 4 says, ooh, these modules in the middle, I need them for my other project. Can we extract those out to a library? And hopefully when we change the library, your code's not going to break. And then Team 1 comes back and says, oops, well, turns out we need to roll back some changes. We didn't do it right. So they make big sweeping changes elsewhere in the code base. And then yet another team says, you know what? We need to deprecate some modules. They're a security concern. We'll keep them for backwards compatibility, but you should use the new version over here. This should sound familiar to anyone who's been developing software for more than a few years. You start off with this pristine picture in your head, a nice design, and what happens? Well, it becomes a whole lot of change. That's a good thing. That's how companies, organizations, governments evolve. We want to embrace change. We're not always going to have a static system that looks like this. There's going to be messy changes, and it's our job to make sure that even as those happen, we are still enabling change in the future. We're not always going to stay at this. When I talk about strength in a code base, a lot of people think that I talk about rigidity, like an iron bar, 
reinforcing concrete somewhere. Uh, and that's not the rigidity or strength I'm looking for. Because an iron bar, as stresses occur on it, it, it won't bend that much. In fact, it might break if it's brittle. Um, you can actually get too brittle if you're too rigid. We don't want rigid code. It will break and it will be brittle. When I talk about strength and robustness of a code base, I want you to think about the tree out in the field, stood there for a hundred years through floods, snow, lightning, wind, wild animals. That tree stands there. It bends but does not break. And it continues to grow. It continues to evolve. The lightning takes off one uh, branch. More branches grow somewhere else. That's what I want you to think about with your code base. So, you have this code base. How do you build it now without knowing what's going to be in the future? Like, how do we even go about that? Well, like everything, the answer is going to be communication. One thing we could do more of is software engineers um, throughout this conference. Make sure that you're communicating with everyone, talking to them, learning about them. Because you'll be fascinated at what you will see and learn from people with different viewpoints. So, how do we build a code base for the future? We need to communicate to the future. But, wait. I don't have direct communication with the original authors behind me and the people in the future. I don't want them calling me while I'm woodworking in the forest or uh, buzzing my cell phone. I'm going to have my cell phone thrown in the river if I'm getting Jira pull requests when I'm trying to walk away from software or from another project or another team. So how do I do this? Well, how do I communicate to the future? Some people will be like, mm, we know, a wiki. I'll create a wiki or a confluence, some documentation portal. Except someone's got to keep that up to date if that information is bad and like everyone has to use it, so you suddenly like, oh, well, what? How else can we? Oh, Slack, or instant messaging. I'll just put information there. Nobody wants to go searching through Slack for the past three years of messages to find out what the answer to a question is or what an original intent was. So how do we preserve this? These design decisions we make today. Well, your code base is the best tool that you have for communicating and collaborating with other developers. So let's use that. And when I say code base, I mean not only your code, but your comments and any version control history that's with that, um, and any artifacts that are checked in in that version control. Pretty much, if I pull your code in your code base, everything that comes with it is useful information to me. You know why? Single source of truth. That code is your system. If, if I want to know how a system works, the code's going to tell me. At least I hope it's going to tell me. So software engineering is unique simultaneously archaeology and time travel. We're looking back to the past, trying to figure out what the original intent is of a piece of code, trying to see if the past can communicate to us, and we're trying to set up the future to succeed by communicating to them. I say let your code base be your Rosetta Stone, that, that artifact that translates from past intention to the current language and helps us understand where our predecessors came before us what decisions they made, what constraints they had. Your code base is an excellent communication tool, but you have to treat it as such. You have to have discipline to treat it as such. I'm going to be talking about how we enact that discipline through robustness. And because almost every speaker likes things of three, I have a triangle here. I'm going to talk about three concepts. Intention, do you mean what you say? Extension, can you change by active extending your code base? And protection. We're humans, we make mistakes. How do we protect each other so that we have a safe place to experiment in code? So I'm gonna start with intention, and this is the base of my triangle, and this is gonna be a, the bigger chunk of my talk because I think it's that important. How do I measure intention? Intention, I, I have to talk about expressiveness, and I actually use a ratio to decide how expressive a piece of code is. I look at the understandable intent to the number of characters. If a code is really well conveyed and I can understand what's going on, that has a lot of understandable intent. And if I can reduce the number of characters while keeping that same amount of intent, it's a win. However, the code's confusing, it has negative intent. Even if I shrink the number of characters, I'm only gonna get more confused. Likewise, even if I have good intent, but it's 700 lines long, I'm gonna get confused well. I can't keep that much in my head. So you have to think about both of these and strike the right balance between intent and number of characters to maximize your expressiveness. So I've been talking abstract. Let's dig into Python. This is a Python conference after all. Let's go. Let's talk about loops. 
here's a while loop. I have some text, it's generic. I have an index. While that index is less than the length of the text, I'm gonna print the character at that index, and I'm gonna implement the index. Pretty straightforward. Uh, I think the intent is okay here. Contrast, with the, contrast that with this. For character and text, print that character. Which would you want to see in a code review? We all go the second one, of course. And why? Some people will say, oh, it's shorter. Yes, but that's not all of it. It conveys intent better. One was a while loop, one was a for loop. The loops you choose mean different things. A while loop is going to say, all right, I'm going to keep looping until a condition occurs. A for loop is going to go over some collection or range for each element in that collection. If I want to print out every character, it sounds like I should use a looping construct that goes over every character, not just looping indefinitely until some, con some condition happens. This is what I mean by intent. The choices you make are going to influence the intent you try to convey. Let's talk about loops. Let's talk about a harder example. Here's a nested for loop. Ooh, scary. For every line and lines, if that line is valid, I check every character in the line. If that character is not ASCII, I return false. If everything works out fine for my valid lines, I return true. Pretty straightforward, but some people say, I really don't like those nested for loops. I'll tell you what, we should do list comprehensions, and then you see this refactor in a code review. Is all ASCII equals, oh wait, what is this length checking doing? And okay, well we have one list comprehension, ASCIIing for um, some character in line. Oh, then there's a nested list comprehension. Some people look at this and go, this is more Pythonic. This is what we should do. And I thoroughly reject that. Yes, we're using list comprehension. And oh, maybe if I use a walrus operator, maybe it could have been more Pythonic. I don't know. But the problem is this does not convey intent. It's technically less lines. It's two lines compared to the six in the previous, uh, set, uh, previous slide. But the intent is obscured. It's not easy to see what this code is trying to do based on the abstractions that it chooses. So why are we checking lengths? What's with the nested list comprehensions? I'd much rather see this code in a code review. Wouldn't you? Even though, yes, we're nesting two loops and it may not be Pythonic, this is way better. It conveys intent better. Again, I'm using for loops where I'm looping over uh, some finite collections. Seems like the right abstraction. There's one better, though, I think. And I actually think it's using the all functions. All functions will look at a list and just say, return true if every element is true. In this case, I return if every line is ASCII for every uh, valid line. And then I check if for each line is ASCII, if every character for every character in line is ASCII. That sounds pretty great. Like, the intent of my algorithm is conveyed through code. People say Python often resembles pseudocode. Well, if your Python doesn't resemble pseudocode, it means you're probably picking the wrong abstractions with wrong intentions. I think some of this problem stems from Zen of Python, and not the Zen of Python itself, how we choose to interpret it, because you see there's this one line that I think is important, that what people see, there should be one, and preferably only one obvious way to do it. And people get hung up on that one, or preferably only one. I just showed three different ways of doing a loop, and I could do more. I could do it in recursion, I could do it with generators, there's more than one way to do things. What do we mean there's only one way to do things? People think it has to be the most Pythonic for some definition of Pythonic, which means I'm using Python features. Look, I used an all or a list comprehension. Look, that's not what Pythonic is. Pythonic focuses on another word that's often overlooked in this quote. Obvious. There should be one obvious way of doing it. Python code is explicit. It's clear and concise. That's why we like writing in Python as opposed to other languages. Make your code obvious. That's what I mean by expressing intention. When a reader looks through it and goes, yeah, 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 makes sense to me, that's great. But if they're scratching their head looking through it in a code review and like, can you explain what you're doing here? You failed the reader. And if you're failing your readers now, you're certainly failing the readers of your code and maintainers of your code years from now when you're not even around anymore to explain it in a code review. Also, quick little tip, code reviews don't preserve information very well. No one goes back, 
and looks at a code review from five years ago to see a design discovery shift. If you're discussing things in a code review, find a way to express that intention in your code base instead afterwards. All this to say, pulling it back, I'm trying to say choose your loops carefully because the abstractions you choose matter. Let's look at something else, collections. Uh, simple question, how should you store a list of names? Everyone should be saying a list. It's right there in the name path. You don't, this is not a trick question. All right, what if I said, I don't want duplicates? Well, most people will say, if you're familiar with it, a set. A set is a collection that doesn't have duplicates. Great. What if I wanted to map the names to some icons? Well, people are thinking about, well, I need a mapping type. A dictionary maps keys to values. That's the natural thing. This is exactly what I'm wanting to express. It may seem simple, but there's something profound here. Instinctively, you're jumping to the right things with collections. What's the right data structure to use to express whether you want duplicates or a mapping? I'm saying you need to choose that for every piece in your code base. You need to think about that sort of decision every time you write a line of code, whether it's a for loop, a collection, a class. You need to ask yourself, what intent are you trying to convey? The abstractions you choose communicate to the future. And when I say abstractions, we can get even deeper. We we're talking about collections. Here's some code that counts the number of icons for, or I'm sorry, counts the number of users using an icon. Counter, I enumerate through some users. If um, the, I'm sorry, if I iterate through the users, I'm not calling the enumerate function. Um, I am saving off a dictionary and I'm incrementing that number every time I see a counter. Abstractions can help us because if I see this in a code review, I have to go through every line and be like, what is this doing? Is that plus equals one? Do I have my if statement right? Is it should be not encounter or encounter? There's better ways of doing this. Why not just use a counter built in from collections? This is an abstraction that conveys exactly what I want, and it's Googleable or insert search engine of your choice here. Maybe using ChatGPT. I don't know. Uh, we have a counter that just counts. All right, for each user icon, here's the number of users that have it. It's much easier to understand this. I haven't sacrificed intent, but I've minimized my number of characters. I haven't uh, at least reduced it. Um, and I'd be happy to see this in a code review. Here, yeah, I'd take it if I didn't know about counter, but there's a lot of code for me to keep track of my head, especially when I have 500 other lines to review. I'd rather just look at something and go, yeah, uh-huh, that looks right, makes sense to me, and move on. The abstractions you choose communicate to the future. I cannot stress that enough. If you see people in the present struggling with the abstractions you choose, that's a good sign that maybe you need to rework them. Because again, it's uh, setting you up for the future in a much better way. The goal of this is reducing time and cognitive burden. We can keep a finite amount of things in our head, and it's not that many. Uh, right? Less than 10 for mo like most people, and then we flush things to short-term memory. Uh, we want to reduce the time and mental stress that it causes to read through code because then we'll reduce frustration, so we'll reduce bugs, and it allows us to deliver value quicker. Just the name of the game. I also want to talk about types. Types are fantastic at conveying our intention. So Python's a strong type language. What that means is that we have types which are really just semantics of our data associated with each variable. Uh, you know, we talked about counter. Counter expresses certain semantics. What do I mean by semantics? The behavior of a type, constraints it has, and relationships with other types that it may interact with. For instance, a counter is a dictionary-like object. So that conveys a certain relationship to me that I'm mapping some item to a count. It gives me constraints. I can't have duplicates as my keys. That's what a type is. It can help us communicate. And the reason why we like counter so much is because it was a type that conveyed the right abstraction. Now, unfortunately, Python is also a dynamically typed language. I say unfortunately, because even though it's really awesome the things we can do with it, it can hurt robustness. Because what dynamically typed languages let you do is let you change the type at runtime. It's not bound at some build time or in your code base. Variables can change text. It can be a string one day, one line, and an int the next. Not too bad when it's on a slide like this, 
But if there's 300 lines of code between these two, you have to put the burden on the reader going, okay, it's a string, it's a string, it's a string, it's, oh, uh, it's an n. So we call this function here. That's not fun to debug or to reason about. If we can't reason about our code, it's going to be much harder for our future collaborators to reason about it as well. But back to types. Other problem is we don't know what types things are. So let's say we need to modify this function, close if done. At some point in time, if it's past the closing time, close it and log it. What's point in time? I talked about the semantics today, like what behaviors does it support? Can I add things to it? Can I subtract it? What can I call on it? What constraints does it have? Is it an int, a string, some custom type, a date time? I don't know. So, what do I do? I need to change it. But what if I get it wrong? What if I say, oh, you know, I'm going to assume it's a string and I'm just going to concatenate some things to it. Well, it, best case scenario, my tests sketch it. Best case scenario, I have tests, I hope. Uh, worst case, uh, that could get to production. And bugs, when they get to production, we might think, oh, it's such a minor bug. Minor bugs have caused property damage before. Minor bugs have caused loss of life before. But even then, minor bugs have caused loss of value. All of these things are important. Some more than others we don't want our bugs to cause loss of life. But every bug has a potential to impact something. So I don't want to get it wrong. So what if I want to be a responsible developer, what is my strategies for determining whether I can concatenate a string to that point in time or add a few hours to it? I can just, you know, YOLO it and put the code in and check it in and just hope something catches it. Maybe a manual testing three months from now. Don't do this. This is irresponsible. Maybe I look at all the call-in code. Everywhere that calls this code, I work my way up the call graph and I see, okay, these five call it with an end, these two call it as a date time. I think I'm okay. But also remember, you're not going to see all the call-in code. There's going to be call-in code that's called in the future that may do different things, maybe created in the future, that does different things than what you're expecting. Or that calling code's in another organization. Maybe you make an API or a library and the calling code belongs to a different organization that you have no control over and you can't even see their code. This goes likewise for tests and documentation. They can help, they can give us hints, but they can't give us that nice authoritative feeling to it. Other developers might look down the call stack or call graph and see what functions does this function call? And say, oh, you know, it, what does it expect? Oh, these three functions and calls expect an int. Well, what if this function calls three functions, calls three functions, calls three functions? That's going to be a pain to go figure out. Because anytime you require a collaborator to trawl through your code to answer a question, you're going to incur a cognitive burden. No one wants to be grepping through a code base to be saying, what type can I use? Use type annotations, especially on your functions. At uh, this point in time, if I put this type hint in, which is that date time, date time, dot date time you see, that tells the reader, oh, it's a date time. This tells the modifier, the maintainer, oh, I know what semantics this data has. I can use a date time, and I can call the methods on date time. The you know, documentation says that I can use. This helps us out as maintainers, so please annotate your types. We also can create our own types, and this is important. Because remember, I said types provide the semantics of your data. Well, if you can build a vocabulary, especially one that maps to your domain, then you can talk to the future really, really well, even if you don't have any physical line of communication with them. User-defined types lets you craft that vocabulary. Before I get into user-defined types, I actually want to take a quick aside about heterogeneous and homogeneous data because this is going to go into intent as well. So homogeneous data. Homogeneous data is data where everything is the same type. A list of ints. Lists, sets, tuples, dictionaries should all be homogene uh, homogeneous data. Heterogeneous data is where the types vary on each element. Maybe the second element is a string. One of them is a float. And this is where problems start to happen because, you know, you think about how do I know where each field is, and it becomes community knowledge that, oh, the second field is always a string. That's the name of something. But as you're looking through code, especially if you just see a static index of one somewhere, you're going to be like, okay, how do I know that's a, a name? Like, especially if you're new to a code base. 
you go look at everywhere that constructed that list, but what if there's hundreds of places that construct the list? Are you sure that you got all of them? Some people go, I know, I'll make a dictionary. I'll start using a dictionary. It's a key value, and uh, that that's what I want. When we think about this, dictionary is almost like this relational database structure where it's like, okay, you know, I have all my keys, I have all my values, I'm going to map them one-to-one. -one. And this isn't accurate either, because a dictionary should be homogeneous, is what I said. You may think, oh, a key and a value, they're two different types, but it's the pairing of the types. That is the, you know, the type of a dictionary is a pair between key and value. And we have the same problem. I see my dict name, and I have to go look at every single place that dictionary was created, especially if it's in a function where I don't know who's passing that in. And again, remember what I said about looking up the call graph? You may not even know about all the call code there is. How do I know that name is generated each time? Do I just say, put in the comments, says, make sure you put in the name? No one's going to read that. What do we do? Some people say, oh, well, I can't do anything with my type checker. I'm just going to say typing.any. This is not the answer. Typing.any has a use, and it's not to be a catch-all, so just I don't know what type this is. Some people say, oh, I'll create a really good type where I map from string to a union of int strings or floats. And no, this isn't great either because any access a, a user looks at says, huh, it could be any one of these three, three things, and I should be checking each one of them for every single dictionary access. That's why dictionaries are not great for heterogeneous data. They separate from where you use it from where it, to where you constructed it, and you require the reader to know about both to get the full picture. Not great. Don't use dictionaries for heterogeneous data. Anytime you require a collaborator to trawl through your code, like how is this dictionary constructed, you will incur cognitive burden. Some people are saying, ah, but Python 3.8 added typed dict, which lets me actually have a full type you know, annotation for what's here. And that's okay, but it doesn't guarantee that the dictionary was actually created to have those fields. There's nothing that about type dict that says, yep, you have a name and a uh, age, you must provide those um, when you construct the dictionary. It's kind of working on faith to some degree. So instead, I want you to think about data classes anytime you have heterogeneous data. Data classes represent a relationship between some data. Here's a data class for a product. It's the same thing as the dictionary before, and it looks pretty similar. ID, name, quantity, weight, and price with their appropriate type annotation so you know exactly what the semantics of each data is. And now when I see this in a function, I see, ah, new product.name. And it's like, okay, I know this has a name, and I can make the data class always have a name. So instead of looking at all calling code, I just look at the definition of a product. I know that I can feel safe, like, okay, unless someone's really doing something really, really, really weird, and they probably should have their hands slapped if they're going around a type system like that, we can be pretty sure that we have that name. And it reduces the amount I have to look through a code base. Fantastic. We're going to use data classes to group data together and reduce errors when we're accessing it. Because remember, we want to communicate intent and prevent future developers from making errors. They will go faster. They will deliver value better. But data classes aren't appropriate for all heterogeneous data. And I want to talk about invariants. Invariants are, oh, everybody should be thinking about invariants in your system. What is an invariant? An invariant is a fundamental truth through your code base. Developers are going to depend on these truths and build assumptions. On them. They're going to reason about them. The more you give them that are rock solid, the more developers create a mental model in their head. Now, these aren't universal truths in every possible system, just your system. So they don't have to be a universal truth across every code base on the planet. Let's talk about pizza, because I love pizza. Here's my invariants for my uh, pizza. I say sauce will never be put on top of other toppings. In this case, cheese is a topping. Again, this is my system. I can define invariants for my system, even if it's not true for pizzas elsewhere. Toppings may go above or below cheese. There's only one sauce. Dough radius can only be whole numbers, no floats. And the raise of the dough may only be between 15 and 30 cents. And let's say I want to automate some pizza making machine. So I have my data class, um, and I say this is my first step. I have a radius and a list of topics. The problem is I can create a good data class, but later on people can just change that however they want. And mm, yeah, that's an invalid pizza. I put Alfredo sauce on top of tomato sauce. I'm a monster. 
Also, some meat or lawn. I'm not sure that's too monstrous. It actually sounds delicious, but I digress. So, this I, I don't have good protection mechanisms. Um, there are. You can make a day class be a little bit more protected, but if you're going to do that, I'd rather you just look at a class instead, because, again, what does a class intent convey? An invariant. So with a data class, we don't expect any variance of our data. It's just data that are independent, and I can change them independently. The class is going to look a little more complicated. This is the initializer of the class, how it gets constructed. What's important is that I'm checking invariance throughout uh, this initializer, making sure the dough is correct, the toppings and sauces. I will prevent people from making a pizza if my invariants are wrong. And any method I write in that pizza class can also preserve those invariants. That way, it's really, really easy to know, yes, when I create a pizza, it will always have dough between 15 and 30 centimeters. It will always have, at most, one sauce. I throw exceptions if I create invalid pizzas. I just can't do it anymore. This reduces errors. You'll also notice that in my initializer, I have some things in here with, that are prefixed by double underscores. These are private members. Nothing's truly private in Python, but it's really easy to see this in a uh, code review when people use private data. Um, they actually have to go through uh, a completely differently named variable to access these fields. It's a main mangled if you're interested. Um, and tooling checks and says, mm, you shouldn't be a private using private member variables for a class. Data classes intent is public independent data. It's available for anyone to change or modify independently. Classes preserve invariants. They help you build reasonability into your code base. Because developers cannot easily modify those invariants as things are going on. The classes allow you to group that interrelated data and preserve invariants across your life at the time. That's when you should use them. Give your future collaborators solid classes to reason upon. I have this quick little uh, flow chart. Um, it, I, I like it. It's just if you have heterogeneous data, Ask yourself if you have invariants. If so, use a class. If not, use a data class. Homogeneous data. Ask yourself, is it just, do I only need one value at a time? It's an enumeration. Or I need a collection of things. Dictionaries, lists, sets, they all kind of fit in that dictionary bucket. Think about this. Like, this should be your default for whenever you're creating new user-defined types. I still say this for intention. The abstractions you choose communicate to the future. I don't care if it's loops, collections, what sort of you know, types you're using, or classes for data classes. Every line of code you write conveys an intent. And the abstractions you choose to write that line of code will matter. And that's what I have to say about intention. I'd like to move on now to extension. What is extension? Well, I need to talk about extensibility or the act of easily modifying the code base. Yeah, you can build the most perfect code base, but if people can't change it as our understanding of the system or the domain evolve, it, they're going to just say, ah, this is horrendous. I'm going to rewrite it because it doesn't do what I need it to. And if we do that, we're slowing people down. We need to make our stuff change. So, extensibility is a property of systems that allows new functionality to be added without modifying existing parts of your system. That's important. This is also known as the open-closed principle. My code is open for extension, but closed for modification. Story time. Uh, I was working on a project one uh, a, a while back in my career, and we had to expose an internal Boolean to a customer to be able to set uh, through their interaction with the program. And there were a few different ways of doing it. Command line, network protocols, GUIs, uh, other machines to do it. And you'd think for an existing Boolean, I should just be able to say like, yep, I flip one switch and it's everything just works and it's all set up to be exposed. But no, I had to go modify 15 files. It's colloquially known as shotgun surgery because you're just spraying a pattern across your code base trying to figure out where the changes have to be. I didn't make those changes right first. I only changed like 13 of the files. I didn't know I had to change the other two files. This is an example of extensibility gone wrong. I wanted to extend the system, and I had to go modify a lot of things to do it. And in doing so, I missed some. When the next person comes, are they going to miss the same files? Are they going to miss different files? How are they going to know they have to go update everything? Here's some good red flags to know that your extensibility is suffering. 
are easy things hard to do? If things that conceptually sound simple, hmm, add an admin account uh, because we have other type of accounts in our system. If that's hard to do, but it sounds conceptually easy, there's a mismatch there. You've set up a lot of croft and a lot of obstacles in your way, what I call accidental complexity. Uh, complexity comes in two forms, necessary complexity, which is the hard things within your domain, like air traffic control is inherently complex. ORMs um, are inherently complex. You're never gonna be able to reduce that complexity. But accidental complexity is, I have to go update 15 files to change a Boolean. Easy things being hard to do means your code isn't extensible. If you encounter pushback on similar features, uh, as saying, hey, can we go implement this? We did something really similar last week. And the dev team says, you no, I know it sounds similar, but that's like four months of, because you know this system isn't meant for that. That's a good sign of, oh, my code's not extensible. If you encounter a push, oh, I'm sorry, if you have consistently high estimates, um, sometimes through story points, uh, uh, t-shirt sizes, agile pointing, um, if your estimates are consistently high, it's telling you that everything in your code base is hard to do, probably uh, should go address that. Also, if your commits contain large change sets, and that's something that's really easy to just script against. Uh, if you are consistently changing large numbers of files, that means you have to do a lot every time you need to make any sort of change. These are all red flags because if it's hard for you to do it today, it will be hard for you in the future to do it later. I'm going to keep saying that again throughout this uh, talk. Make it easy for your future, and if it's hard for you now, don't expect it to be any easier if you don't do anything about it. How are your future collaborators going to extend your code? Let's talk about dependencies, because this is kind of the heart of extensibility. So dependencies are relationships. They, I depend on something else to do something for me. I, there's a relationship there. Dependencies facilitate reuse. This is great. I don't want to write my own linear algebra library. I'm, use I'm not going to go write my own web server. I'm going to use Flask or Django. I depend on them, but I get to reuse all the hard work that came before me. Dependencies are necessary. You're in, even lines of code depend on the lines above. It. You have to have dependencies in your system. It's not just I import a package or not. Dependencies are dangerous. Every dependency introduces a new uh, attack surface for security. Um, it introduces behavior that you're not in, always in control of. Uh, if someone who's writing the dependency decides to change functionality and you consume it, I hope you have really good testing because maybe it's incompatible with your mental model of things. I think this is the most profound XKCD that's been written in the XKCD uh, cartoons of, where all modern digital infrastructure is based on this little tiny block of some random person somewhere in the world has been maintaining since 2003. Um, and thanklessly, like they're, they're not getting any accolades. Remember, everybody who writes a dependency, they're their own people. They have their own schedules, their own deadlines, their own constraints, their own challenges. They're not going to jump because you say jump, and you have to plan for that. You have to think about how to manage dependencies, because if you're not careful, if you lock them in, your code's not going to be extensible, because it's so hard to change anything, because your dependencies are mismanaged. Extensibility is all about managing dependencies. There's certain types of dependencies. Depending on the type of the dependency it is, will influence how you get extensibility on it. So let's talk about physical dependencies. I'm going to go back to my automatic uh, pizza maker, actually, just in a second. Um, a physical, I should define physical dependencies first. Um, importing a package or a, a module is a physical dependency. A function calling another function is a physical dependency. I see it in my code base and I can draw a direct line to that. All right. Now let's talk about the pizza making system. So I have my automated pizza making system. A customer comes in, they pay for their pizza. The pizza making system checks for any orders, finds one, goes and makes them. The customer gets seated. And that table management system is going to check when is the pizza done so that it can make sure that it's serving the pizza. Let's imagine you're developing this, and there's three teams. Your team's in charge of the pizza making system, the machinery, the actual like system that makes pizzas. Another team works on the table management system. They work in another building on the campus, though. You don't talk to them that often. Um, and payment system. Well, payment is kind of boring, to be honest. Like, so we hired some contractors to go do it. They've done it before. Really easy. They just gave us the API for checking for orders. Fantastic. And then you say, okay, well, I want to 
introduce a new menu item, a strong bolt, which is like a photo pizza for those of you unfamiliar. And so people go, okay, well, my table management system can check for Stromboli, so I'll update that. My payment system has to be able to put Stromboli on the menu. My pizza making system has to be able to make a Stromboli. So you coordinate all these changes over a few months. Everything goes great. You're ready to deploy. You hit deploy, and it starts going out. And oh no, it's broken. There's a bug. The VP of engineering is breathing down your neck saying, customers are calling, they're angry, we need you to fix this. You go, okay, okay, well, it's 8 o'clock at night, um, let me find the table management people. Oh, they're in their after party, after a successful deploy, they don't even know what's going on. They're in no state to code. Okay, let me talk to the contractors to rip it off of the menu. Oh, nope, they've turned off their phones for the night, they have other, or they have other projects. Okay, well, I can rip out Stromboli's from a pizza making system and revert that but I can't change the other people's code. And then you're in for a long night of trolling through other people's codes, trying to get the changes out, because you have three places to go make that change just to revert the, the uh, Stromboli thing. If we invert these dependencies, though, at least in one place, we can get a much better system. What if I drew the arrows like this? What if the payment system got the menu items from the piece making system? It didn't assume what was there. Uh, and, and displayed the menu based on what was available. Look at the direction of the arrows. Pizza making system depending on payment system. Payment system depending on pizza making system. I've inverted the dependencies. Now there's a single source of truth in my pizza making system. Hey, the pizza making system supports Stromboli. Everything queries it. If I don't, if I rip out Stromboli, everything should just flow through and work. Which would you rather be? Uh, doing in that sort of scenario that I described earlier. And some of you might have anxiety of me uh, recounting a very harrowing experience that you yourself may have lived through um, in similar systems. Would you rather be scrambling across multiple teams trying to figure out, oh, well, we have all these dependencies between us and we have to update them in lockstep, or do you just want to change it in one place and everything flows through? I know which one I'd pick. In contrast to physical dependencies, there's also logical dependencies. So a logical dependency isn't something that's apparent just by inspecting your code base. There's no physical linkage um, that I can look at through tooling. So right here, maybe this is a notification of, hey, my pizza's been made. I'm telling the table management system, but here's a pizza. Well, I have requests. I have a physical dependency on requests, which I'm using for HTTP um, posting. But I don't actually know who's going to receive my HTTP message. It goes over a network, probably some other computer named Table Management. I don't know who serves at that point. And that's interesting because it means while it might be tough for me to look through it, I can substitute that Table Management endpoint at any time and my code doesn't have to change. When I change a physical dependency, the code that consumes it, that dependency or uses that dependency often needs to change. The logical dependency, I can swap things out and the calling code's none the wiser. So that gives us something interesting from extensibility. If you convert your physical dependencies to logical dependencies, you improve substitutability. That lets you extend. Imagine just writing a new subsystem and plopping it right in, and it just works, as long as you uphold the same contract, that is. But yeah, that's, that's fantastic. That's open-close principle. But there's a cost. Logical dependencies are hard to reason about. Because you can't just look through a call graph and see what's happening. I would just end up in requests code. I have no idea what happens when the table management system sees pizza. So I lose reasonability. There's a fine balance here. There is no right answer of when you should have physical and when you should have logical dependencies, but you need to think through it and decide, do I want substitutability or do I want reasonability more in my system? All right, again, I've been talking abstract. Let's get back to Python. Um, I'm going to give you an example of an architecture that I think does logical dependencies really, really well. And it's really useful for extensible code. I'm not saying all of your systems have to look like this. Treat it as an example. So I'm talking about event-driven architectures, and that's where your code base is broken up into producers of events and consumers of events. Here's some examples. So like a producer might be a kitchen timer going off or the last call for a boarding at an airport. That's a producer of an event. A consumer might be uh, a chef taking a casserole out of the oven, knowing the timer's done, or some family is rushing, they need to make their connection, they hear the last call, they know they have to rush a little faster. There's a reaction 
to some stimulus. That's what event-driven architecture is all about. Uh, and we're going to talk about PubSub, Publisher Subscribe. So here's my made-up system. Here's, let's say, I'm doing delivery from the pizza again, um, and I want to, one of my orders completed, I package it up, I notify the customer, and I notify the restaurant that the order is done. It's fine, except now the requests start coming in. Management wants to know. Vendors want to know when an order is done so they can track inventory. There's telemetry and payment systems that need to know. Security wants to know so that they can audit things. Well, I don't want to have to keep changing this code every time I, I have any new consumer. Because the boss only wants it on Mondays. He wants a weekly digest. And the vendors want it monthly. And I don't want to embed all that logic into here. That's annoying. I want to decouple the producer of my event when all is done from the consumers. And we're going to look at PyPub sub for this. So PyPub sub is just a Python package I like for publishing and subscribing. Um, here I have a notified customer. This is when an order is done. And I subscribe to some topic, in this case, meal done. And when that topic is going to be invoked, I'll call notify customer. Conversely, on the publisher side, I just publish a meal done event, and I pass the order along with it. Here's how I can decouple my producers and consumers. The idea is you have some central message group, in this case, PyPub sub, and the producers, produce events, subscribers, listen to those events, but there's no physical linkage between a producer and a subscriber. They just depend on the message group. This is all logical dependencies. And remember, a logical dependency promotes substitutability. I can add new subscribers without ever changing a producer. I can add new producers them, without ever changing a subscriber. That's the beauty of this. I can swap things out. This is an example of how to make things more extensible, especially when we think about how our dependencies are laid out. So when you get back to your code base, think about what's easy to change and what's not. Start drawing little boxes and arrows to figure out if it's a physical or logical dependency. See how you can tweak that to make your life easier. Event-driven architectures let you extend functionality by creating new producers and new consumers, or removing them, or modifying them. This is an example of keeping your code extensible where needed. And where needed is important. Don't make everything extensible because then you lose reasonability. Remember what I talked about with physical dependencies. Your future collaborators shouldn't have to worry about changing code. They should just be able to extend, and it works. And that's extension. I'm going to finish this talk up by, of course, talking about the last of my three, protection, or the uh, protecting people. Because, you know, we're going to make mistakes. The air is human. To write bug-free code is defined. We're not going to be writing bug-free code anytime soon. Yes, we have AIs helping us. Yes, we have all sorts of cool static analysis tools. Those all help. We're always going to have bugs in our code, even just because the English language is messy and a mismatch of requirements. I want to talk about some strategies of how we address this. Your future collaborators will not have the history of the code base that you have. They're not going to be as intimately familiar with all the design decisions you made. So as they go and change code, you want to give them a comfort zone where they can change things and feel like, I'm probably not breaking anything. I feel comfortable. So to do that, I want you to enshrine your decisions, your context, your constraints, into static analysis and tests. So let's talk about static analysis. These are tools that look through your code base. They don't run your code, but they look for certain patterns and alert you on patterns. Type checkers. I talked about type annotations earlier. A type checker helps make sure your type is super consistent. It's going to look through all the type annotations in your system and say, okay, does anything mismatch? Are you passing an int or you expect a string? Or vice versa. It checks for consistency. So I as a human don't have to. MyPy is probably the most popular one. There are other ones out there. I encourage you to look at them. But we're going to play a game. It's called Spot the Bug. I'm going to pull up some code. There's at least one bug in the uh, piece of the code that I pull up. I'm going to give you about 10 seconds to find out where that bug is. Ready? Go. So it reads and reverses a file. Uh, opens a file, reads it, and does a simple reverse. Where's the bug? All right. It's been about 10 seconds. Some of you have found it. I've written this code enough times that I will be like, yeah, I've made this mistake before. There should be a decode instead of an encode. 
The amount of times I made that mistake, though, is embarrassing, honestly. Um, my Pi finds this in milliseconds, not the 10 seconds I'm in. And this isn't a code review. Like, some of you might say, oh, yeah, it's a slide. I read it. It's just three lines. I found the bug. Easy. Try doing it when you're in a code review with 100 lines of code. Are you going to spot that as easily? Next one. Find the bug. Go. Taking a list, adding some double values, so like one, two, three becomes one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, actually, no, that should become two, four, six. I can't do math on my slide, sorry. So I uh, add doubled. Uh, yeah, I see a collection update. I have a list comprehension. the bug in the list comprehension. Well, it's been about uh, 10 seconds, and well, turns out update is on sets, and I passed in a list. I should have been calling the extend function. My pie catches this within milliseconds. It's checking my type annotation saying, ah, update's not callable on list. Sorry. My pie detects both bugs within milliseconds. I'd much rather have that than me looking through that in a code review and potentially missing it. Use your type annotations to confer semantics, intention. But use a type checker to enforce it and protect your future developers. Another static analysis to a pilot. Most people are familiar with linting. It's looking for common Python bugs. Let's play spot the bug again. I'll give you 20 seconds because there's two bugs up here. I'm adding some cookbooks to an author. Author names, cookbooks. Finding an author. If I don't find it, I'll assert. But if I do find it, I'll call extend. It's not an update versus extend. You can treat it as a, a list in this case. And I return true. There's the two bugs. So it turns out that that cookbooks equals a uh, empty list is not good. That's called a mutable default value, and that will cause bugs. The second bug is that not all of my return paths return the same type. And my Pi doesn't actually catch this, at least not when I ran it uh, about a few months ago. So you're saying, well, we assert false. It's fine. Like, we'll raise an exception. But what if you have assertions turned off? Do you know you can do that? You know, some people do that for release builds. Uh, that will just return none. So I'll return true in one case, none in another. That's not good. Pylint found both of those in milliseconds. And even better, we talked about extensibility. Go look at Pylint's plugin system. That is a great case of extensibility. Um, you can create your own plugins for Pylint to check your own business logic or domains. Um, anything that's specific to your code base, you can write a checker for that tooling catch the things that can be automatically checked. Um, some honorable mentions, I can't go into these because I'm running out of time. Uh, PISA, which is a really cool type checker with uh, security taint analysis. Bandit for catching common security bugs. And McCabe for checking uh, cyclomatic complexity in your code. Uh, if the, these words mean anything to you, go check them out. All right. Last, I want to talk about testing. And this is not going to devolve into the how do you go test code? I think we have enough talks on that. Uh, you know you should be unit testing. You know you should be writing tests. I'm not going to get into that. I want to talk about why we write tests and then what we can do to make our tests better. So tests protect value. Uh, quality is some value to some person. I love that quote. It's from uh, Gerald Weinberg. It's so vague. Some value to some person. What that means is if it's important to anybody, it's valuable. And tests are there to protect your value. It tells future developers, oh, when you make this change, you're not sacrificing the value, the predetermined value that we want to be protecting. They give your future collaborators a safety net. We often see this diagram. You know, unit tests on the bottom. You've got to write a boss of them. You need to be fast. And you don't write as many integration tests. You don't write many UI tests. And then people complain about, well, Unit testing isn't that useful, or it, it should be a component tests, and we all have different views of this testing pyramid. I'm sure many of you have seen this, and I've seen some of the discussions. When you think about tests, I want you to think about the testing pyramid like this. You want to write a lot of high value to cost tests. They have a high value compared to their cost. You want them to run fast and frequently. The more infrequent tests, you want to run, write they have a low value to cost. Maybe they're expensive to run, but they're still somewhat valuable. 
Think about the value your tests provide. What questions do they answer? Make sure the tests that are running answer the questions you care about. And think about the costs of your tests. How easy is it to write tests? How easy is it to maintain tests? Running tests, maybe you can be parallelizing them, using less hardware, using cloud resources instead of on-prem, using on-prem instead of cloud. Whatever makes sense for your organization, you have to think about costs. Stop trying to group tests in a different category. Think about value and cost and figure out what's more useful to run more often or more frequently. I'm going to go beyond unit integration tests. Um, I could talk a lot more about unit integration tests and how useful they are, but I think other talks are going to cover that, and I want to talk more about the next steps on there. So this is for the people who want to go beyond the simple unit integration test ideas. Let's talk about acceptance testing. So Excel acceptance testing is a validation. It is testing what the customer expects to do. That's different from unit testing. Unit testing is a verification. It's testing that the code does what a developer wants the code to do. Those are different things. And if you treat them as the same, you're going to have a bad time. My tests, my unit tests, are going to tell me, yes, I'm double checking all the code that I wrote. I've checked error cases. The tests are what I as a developer expect them to be. If I write completely 100% line coverage tests, branch coverage tests, and I'm really happy with it, I still can fail because the customer might not be expecting any of that. They might think this is the wrong product. If you build a customer a wrong product, it doesn't matter how polished it is, they're not going to want it. So I can't talk about acceptance testing without talking about Gherkins, specifically the Gherkin specification language. So the Gherkin specification language is a way of writing requirements. Uh, the a feature you can kind of think of as a, a test suite a scenario, a test case. So I'm looking for substituting vegans. And then I have a given when then, a precondition, an action, and a post condition, or a range act assert if you're familiar with that unit testing. Given an order containing a cheeseburger, when I ask for vegan substitutions, then I receive a meal with no animal products. That's a single test. And you might be saying, what's special about this? Well, what's cool is there's a Python library called Behave that can map that text into Python code. So I have a decorator for given. And whenever I see a given, it's going to map here's the code that needs to run. Whenever I see that when statement, I ask for vegan substitutions, that's going to be the code that it runs. So I've now started looking at specifications, my requirements, the things I talk to my customers with. And I'm mapping them to my test case, my Python code. My requirements are now executable. My specifications are inherently testable and tested. If a customer changes their mind, they just write a new specification. And if it uses the vocabulary that I've outlined through something like behave, they don't even have to talk to me. They can just run and say, oh yeah, the system does that, or the system doesn't do that, or this isn't supported. We should talk about it more. This is a great way of aligning expectations for what a customer actually wants and making sure that you have testing to go alongside it. So you can use acceptance testing to help drive business conversations and create executable specifications. Now, next I want to talk about property-based testing. This is a great way for having fragile tests. Because test fragility slows people down. No one wants to change code and then see a test way over there fail and it has nothing to do with your code or it's flaky. Like that's going to lose confidence in your tests. It's going to frustrate people and cost time and money. We don't want any of that. Let's take a look at a more traditional test. Um, I'm testing a meal recommendation system. Give me some calories. Give me a three-course meal underneath that category. Okay. Yep, this looks fine. What happens when recommend meals wants to use some new deep learning algorithm? And it has non-determinism in it. Oh, no. Non-determinism is the enemy of unit tests, what we're all told. It, you know, I got a flaky test, I won't really know, and it gets frustrating because it's like, well, I could mock out recommend meals, but that's the thing I want to test. How do I know that's working? Enter property-based testing. So property-based testing is testing the invariance of resistance. There's that word again, invariance. It's testing the properties rather than specific cases. So in this case, I'm checking that I have three meals. One's an appetizer, one's a salad, one's a main dish in that order. I'm also making sure that my calories are under a certain limit. 
I'm checking properties. Now, as long as whatever tool is recommending those meals fits my properties, my test will still pass. I don't have to go say, oh, instead of a you know spring roll, I'm getting a loop here or something like that. Like, no, it's it just automatically keeps working, which is what we want. There's a cool Python tool called Hypothesis that I want to make you aware of. Hypothesis generates test cases for you. It does property-based testing. But you can see this given when I'm saying, hey, give me integers. Hypothesis will pick what integers to pick. And it'll pick different ones every time. It can use a shared database to even track among a team of, okay, these people found these errors with these cases. I'm going to test those more often. Um, but I'm always going to keep trying to inject new values, try to find different boundary values super useful when it's not very clear where the boundary values of your test case input is. So yeah, um, you can do a lot of things with Hypothesis. I could give a full talk just on Hypothesis. You can do fuzz testing, you can do algorithmic testing, um, you can write your own uh, Hypothesis given, so in this case integers, there's a bunch of built-in things, you can write your own. So really useful for generating unit tests. You're using property-based testing to avoid fragility. You're encoding your actual needs. It's great. Generative testing will cover a wide range of input values, and it can even be used for fuzzing. If you're taking untrusted input from an untrusted source, you should be fuzzing your code. This is a great tool for helping you with that. It gives the future confidence to change. Now, that's all I have to say about protection. Um, there's much more we can talk about, but keep these all in mind. I've shown some examples, but it's not the full story. Intention, are you expressing what you say? Extension, how easy is it to modify things? I showed some examples of just scenarios. Ask yourself on your own code basis how easy things are to modify. And protection, how easy is it for people to make mistakes and catch those before they go out the door? If you focus on all three of these, you will have robust code. I fully believe it. And you will have a happier developer team and happier future future developer teams why did i give this talk we're wrapping up i don't think it's any surprise to people that software is doing the world like everyone is looking for everything in software there are more jobs out there right now than there are developers we're only going to see our ranks swell as new developers join the workforce we're also going to see a lot of older systems start to be taken over by new teams or updated don't ask me how scared I am for the, the Unix time rollover bug. But there's going to be a lot of change, and we should be embracing it. But we're all in this together to some degree. Like, yeah, I'm working on one product today. I'm going to go work on another product 10 years from now, probably, uh, on a different team, different organization. Who knows where I'm going to be in 10 years? I want to walk into that code base and feel good. I want you to walk into any code base and feel good. I want you to look around and say, yeah, I can handle this. I can make changes. I don't want you to be you know, bogged down by slow, inefficient processes and code. I want it to optimize. We're in this together. And so we need to start thinking about that and making decisions now to help not just the developers around us, but anyone else in the future. And it's easy to take kind of a fatalistic view of like, well, I'm not going to work on it, whatever, it'll be broken. But is that really how you want everybody to treat their systems, especially critical systems, air traffic, normal traffic, banking, hospital systems, like any of these, like we all, we need to be setting a good precedent for our, ourselves as engineers. And that's what I'm calling on you to do today, is to start thinking about what are you gonna start doing for the future? Start setting that precedent so we make it a norm in our industry that we write solid, stable code. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, my name's Pat Biafor. I'm a principal software engineer at Cloud Software Group. I own a contracting uh, company called Kuzera. I'm the author of Robust Python. If you liked this talk, there's plenty more where that came from in that book. And I'm an organizer of a Python meetup. If you want to reach out to me, feel free to tweet me at Pat via forever, or you can email me pat at kuzera.com. As I close, I want to thank all of you. Thank you so much for listening to this talk, um, being here virtually, enjoying it. But also a call to action. I mentioned a little bit earlier, but think about the people around you. Remember that every developer that you meet today, during the conference, whenever, is a smart human being who wants to build cool stuff. 
a definition of a software engineer in my mind. Help them go build cool stuff. They're going to have their own life, their own choices, you know, different challenges in you, different obstacles, different things that matter to them. And that's all okay. We should still be able to band together and build software that stands the test of time. So here's what I say to you. Go forth and build software that stands the test of time so that you can walk into code and be proud of it. We often say, oh, you know, the future maintainer may be you six months from now. That's, that's too cliche. I want to go even harder than that statement. The person who maintains your code might be a spouse a few years ago. <laughs> Do you want them coming home complaining about your code? It might be a sibling a few years later. Do you want them to be associated with your family? What if your children look at your code 10, 20 years from now and have to maintain it? Are you going to be setting them up for success? I hope so. Like I said, go forth, be awesome, build awesome things. We can do better. Let's go do it. Thank you so much. Field of startups. Startups oftentimes are engaged with the mentality of build fast, break things. And oftentimes they have to rewrite the code because they pivot from one business point to another. Now, is it possible or even worth it to build robust code in early stages of development where you have to build at a very quick velocity? Yes. Um, I think that's a great question. The It is possible, but I won't always recommend it. So when we talk startups, we think of MVPs, like how do I build something quick so that I can get more investors? You're probably going to throw away the code anyway. I hope you throw actually throw away the code because if you have a proof of concept living longer, it's going to be a problem because it's not written in a robust way. Think of your value proposition. It's all down to value versus cost. Some things might be costly to make robust. A personal project, something you're doing for learning, or an MVP. I'm okay saying that cost is too high. But things like type annotations should be close to like free. Those are cheap. Things like making sure your code is well-intentioned, that's pretty cheap too. Yeah, you might not write all the acceptance tests that you have or you know some of the more heavy, robust practices, but it's not an all-or-nothing thing. Make your system extensible. I mean, your code is going to change. I, nothing pivots more than a startup trying to find their mark. Make your code easy to change so that you'll have an easier time doing that. Also think about, all right, yeah, we're two developers now. We're starting to get bigger. We got through our round A or whatever for our initial seed. Well, what happens when you bring on the third developer or the fourth developer? What's your reputation going to be if they come and say, no, this is a mess. Don't work there, guys or girls or any other gender, whatever. Uh, it could be anything like that. Like you don't want to have a bad reputation or, you know, hit your first mark in, with investors and then slow down to a crawl because you can't scale. So find that balance. Think about what your value is, make it valuable, and try to minimize cost. Don't have to do everything, but try to do more than nothing. Mm, I see. That's a really good answer. And as Sony had said, don't fall in love with your code. Um, also, another question that I have is with regards to building robust code, I've seen how some codes are changed so that it is more readable. Is Should the developers also consider looking at performance, the performance of the code? And if so, what should be the priority? Should it be performance or robustness of the code? So to me, performance is a requirement. There's some target for performance that you're looking for. If, if that target is server web page in under a second, you might be quite lenient. If your code is, this is in a tight loop and I need to do, to do 2,000 requests per second, that's a requirement. Your code should convey the intent of the requirement you're solving. So I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Yes, sometimes performant code will not be as readable but document with comments around it, make it really clear why you're making those design choices, make really good commit messages so that when someone comes in and says, what is this doing? I don't understand it. They have supporting actions to say, oh, it's for performance reasons. I should not refactor this to break out this one critical piece. But when dealing with performance, measure first, 
then change your code. Don't change your code because you think, oh, I think this is slow. Do measurements and prove to yourself that it's a bottleneck and then figure out where you need to go.